Hi, everybody. Welcome to a new edition of the QuickShot interview series. My name is Flo, and today I'm joined by a musician who I like to call the man of a thousand layers, and we're going to find out why that is. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dr. Julian Petrin. Hi there. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Florian. Um, forgive me for stressing the professor doctor, but I actually think I'm never going to host a professor again, so I gotta do this. <laughs> yeah, so, thank you. Um, so I did a little research on the internet and I found out that you're an architect, a writer, a consultant, an urban developer, a speaker, a teacher, a professor, a lecturer, advisor, researcher, and a musician. So my first question, why, how, when, how? <laughs> <laughs> it seems more. I think it seems more complicated um, um, than it than it reads. Um, so I'm. Um, I have may, maybe I have two like professional lives, um, and one one uh, life that I live really that is being an urban developer, being an urban planner actually. So I'm not as much an architect as more maybe more an urban designer, urban planner, and this is all my occupations where I make money from. So. Um, Teaching, for example, has been part, I have to say, I dropped the professorship, so I'm not professor anymore, so oh, got a bit lighter <laughs> in all my things. A bit. And um, yeah, and, and, but I always, um, my, my second um, option for life was always to, to make music professionally. You know, my father's been a musician uh, in his early life. He's been a jazz drummer professionally. And um, I grew up with a lot of music. And so it was always, in all my family, there's this thing like, one side is the music side and one side is probably the other side. And so we're switching um, with both sides a little bit. So, so this is maybe, it sounds complicated, but at the end, it's a pretty simple story. It's uh, like the day, your day has uh, double the amount of hours than my day does. <laughs> so so uh, can you really separate the musician from the, the official person? Or is this uh, one creative person at all? I think at the end it's one creative person and um, when I when I started making music I was always interested in in the um, yeah in telling a story with my music so I'm a very big fan of of the 60s and 70s and, and the 80s French film music for example um, Vladimir Kosma, Francis Lay, these composers, um, Michel Legrand which tell a story really together with the directors and you know what I do with urban development is also kind of storytelling. I'm telling story about possible futures in the city. So this is maybe the thing that binds together. And of course, there were some situations where I tried to bring in some of the musical things into my work, to the urban development work. So for example, if you do like, yeah, interactive, immersive, like presentations and things like that, and you add some Easter egg, like the music of yourself inside. and. So, but at the end, I have to say, yeah, it's it's the same persona, I would say. So uh, you're creating this um, unique mix of neoclassical, ambient, down tempo, uh, mm -hmm. layered tracks. So taking your latest release, uh, Moon Race, as an example, um, where do these soft, soothing, roomy textures come from? Is is it a, a thing that? is created from your heart and soul or do you have uh, something like a muse or an inspiration to gather all the the musical uh, stuff for it mm. maybe it's like i i have um like a kind of ideal in my mind um that, that is about a big about a bit about hugeness about softness about creating a, a big space and things like that. And I have to tell that sometimes I want to, to, to go on new roads music, uh, music wise. <laughs> and I discover myself always coming back to this ideal uh, sound, like, which is, um, yeah, which is about combining this kind of melodical elements with a kind of spatial and, and, and warm and embracing, let's say, sound world. And I don't know, it's maybe some influenced by the 80s. Um, you know, bands like, I don't know, Early On D or Art of Noise or things like that. So they have heavily influenced my musical taste, probably. So with you telling just now that you tried to do different things, what was the craziest different musical thing you ever tried? 
Oh, I have some tracks uh, <laughs> that has, have to be released, and I'm thinking about releasing them under different names. They are much edgier and much, much sharper, rhythm orientated, and um, probably more into classical electronica somehow, and some somehow more ironic than the than the at heart stuff that I do. So this is kind of testing out things is for me, it's, it's very important. But when I release these, these songs and this was my plan to, because I, I have collected like very, I don't know, 10 uh, tenths of, uh, <laughs> to, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 of, of musical themes that I want to re-record now over the decades, the last two or three decades. And, and these are like the, the, the themes that are at heart and so i i want to to go this um go for this huge sound with those tracks but there will be of course some some uh let's say um variations on that or, or testing out other 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 paths of, of of musical composition beside that so with you collecting all those ideas over the years I noticed there has been a hiatus between 2003 and 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. uh, so uh, why didn't you keep releasing music once you started? Uh, was it a career choice or uh, was there any interruption of your musical creational process? Yeah, I think maybe two things. On the private side, I became father in 2006. So this somehow, yeah, put it another layer into my life, very important layer. Um, and, but the other thing is that also technically, I have to say this was a big disruptive time for me because on one side, in you know, 2003, I released a CD. It's, this is quite like, like the classical album concept and I released it really on a hard copy CD mode. And then all the streaming thing came up. And first of all, there was the Napster time, but then the streaming time times came. And the other thing is that I switched my, my whole equipment from having um, uh, hardware synths to working with software synths almost only. So I had to reinvent my, my whole, let's say, way of making music. And in the same time, I could discover a lot, a lot of things. And this was the period where I wrote the most of the, of the tracks I'm going to starting to release, to release now. And I've started to release now. So, yeah, it has not been a passive or non-productive time but more behind the curtains okay so so you actually plan to release tracks from this time uh, after doing a bit a bit of rework on it uh, to a, to a new yeah. album or cd uh, a streaming yeah. uh, album yeah. I, i guess <laughs> yeah so uh, do you work uh, with the team to produce your tracks or is this a one-man gig um, I have some friends I consult and now I started to work with um, two mastering um, experts, for example. I have a very dear colleague who is doing visual arts. I started to involve, so I'm starting to go for a more team, teamy um, uh, way of working. But usually I, I compose um, uh, for my, on my own. So this is a very, maybe, you know, with my other professional life, my creativity is, is always a thing of negotiation of mostly also political negotiations when you do urban development. So making music is really a chance for me to go for my own personal vision. This is a pretty egoistic probably thing, but at the end, it's a lot of fun. I don't think so because you always could choose to work with other musicians as well, but, it, yeah. but, but you have the, the, the full, um, creational flow is just if you can decide any nuance of your own uh, so probably that gives you a, the freedom to do or not to do whatever you want yeah. so um, yeah but i'm thinking I, i'm thinking about involving um people for the production part because I'm, i i feel that i'm reaching a kind of roof there with my experiences and skills which are not so high into professional production so all these little tricks and things that you can do in, in order to to somehow yeah push up little your 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 arrangement and your production so it would it would be good to have a consultants or a kind of co-creational mode there and i started to discover this kind of lander network tool that there is you can contact some some other guys and i started to contact people and that seems pretty interesting for me so uh, are you a self-taught musician or did you have classical training back in the days I had classical training for, I don't know, maybe 
nine, eight, ten years, something like that. And I had some jazz training. I continued with jazz training with a what salsa pianist. So and um, so and since I told you my 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 father was a very yeah straightforward jazz lover. My mother also. So and they didn't accept much anything else than jazz. This is how some jazz nerds are. So I had a high let's say level little bar to 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 rise. Yeah. <laughs> on, on what instruments had you this training? Oh, I trained. Uh, I, I I learned piano, classical way. So and I now do some percussion things. So this is why I love like refined percussions. Would you say the classical training is still the base or the core of what you create, or would you say if you haven't mm -hmm. had any training at all, you could always sit down with a synth and just dabble around and you get something uh, serious out of it? Paul, it's a good question. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Like if I look towards impressionist um, composers like Debussy, um, which I played and I loved really, um, and I stopped then because it was getting too hard. And um, um, these are probably patterns or emotional patterns that I try to reproduce. And, and the other thing is that I, I would say that, um, let's say some kind of the technical Yeah, understanding of how to play with both hands asynchronously and and this is something you can it's good to have the training when especially when you're a kid you it really like goes into your brain um deeply and you're pro hopefully not going to lose it then but i would say the the overall song structure is more influenced by the i would say classical pop song i still love this kind of three minute concept or four minute concept that tells a story in this like say rigid format and and so it's like the haiku uh, uh, in, in Japanese poetry yeah. it's a very strict format and you can do a lot with that it's, it's fun how many of your tracks um, have been created because they were meant to be a background music of presentations or things like that <laughs> let's say not presentations this is always what I say I, I I have like those images in mind, like it's, it's like these filmy, filmy scenes or movie like scenes, which are not so concrete. It's not like the concrete story, but it's like more like situations, atmospheres. And so I, I, I say if I could choose now, I would probably go for making score of film music because this is really something I love the the interaction between the visual uh, part and the audio part and mm -hmm. which creates then a whole new atmosphere. So um, let's talk about your early works for a second. Uh, uh, clicking through your arsenal of songs, uh, I noticed that the early works had a bit more energy, bite, and tension, uh, yeah. in my opinion. Uh, so what changed? Was it the, the, the family and work life that changed you? Uh, did you get mm -hmm. older and, uh, let's say, wiser in the creational process, or what changed? That's interesting. Um, I never thought about that, but... Um could be that you're getting more reflective and more like self-critical and you lose some of the spontaneous let's say yeah a bit like not thinking about the result and pushing things out so i think i think this is um maybe one reason and um another is that i really um some way uh, or somehow i'm looking for this kind of perfect let's say sound which is at the same time yeah huge and big as i say sad but also let's say transparent and so this maybe is a too reflective or too cognitive way of composition that maybe um, erases some of the spontaneous uh, moments in, in music could be yeah, interesting what would you say that um if you create a track if you start from scratch um Is there, is there a static process uh, from start to finish? You start, I don't know, with the rhythm and then put on layers after layers until the finished product? Or, or is it always a different approach to the finished track? Mostly um, the tracks start with a central idea, which somehow I get hooked on. So, and that could be a certain um, harmonic pattern or, or sequence, um, could be a rhythmic pattern also i started also tracks based on the on a rhythm pattern or um could be also that i start on the piano 
um, because some of the tracks are really piano driven or piano based and this is why I sometimes sometimes say that a good let's say pop or instrumental pop songs should be also be transferable on the piano and still there should be something there so this is what I believe and um, so that that's the reason probably because some of the tracks start there so but there must be always something that I really hook on pretty deep so that I get the, the lust to work on and to make more out of it and then it grows and and then it's the, the the most difficult part is not to follow always always the same rules or, or, or routes or, or or streets then to to test out new things and allow them yeah, yeah it would all sound equal uh, if you did that yeah that's that's yeah. a problem yeah so um Let's have a look into the future. What's next for you, Lampetrin? Uh, is it a new album? Are there single releases of uh, single tracks? Uh, or what do you have in mind for 2022? Yeah, I have, I have two, let's say, projects in the row. One is a bit more, um, let's say, synth orientated, a bit, a bit more, a little bit more, yeah, some, some things a bit more experimental or edgy than the previous things I released. Um, this is one project, kind of an album, you could say, um, also with a kind of conceptual frame around it. I love those concept albums um, from the 70s, 80s, they really have a story around it. And the other thing is that I have a collection of piano, almost piano, not only, but really piano intense um, works um, that I want to re-record in a better uh, way. This is probably the second project I'm, I'm working on. And the, I would say the, the hard part about it is that if since I'm doing music yeah, aside my professional life with those yeah, several layers, um, working on an album is very, needs a very, very much patience and, and a very strong grip. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. It's not like releasing a single, which also can take several last thing it was like three months until I was really satisfied with the sound and things like that. So, um, but an album is another part of work, I would say. Are you even in charge of the promotional aspect of your work, like uh, advertising or, or the releasing part of it? Yeah, yeah, I do this uh, myself. Um, I looked out for some support, but I have to say I didn't find a satisfying one. The thing is that I think my music sits pretty much between niches. So it's not like the typical chill out music. It's not the typical, amb it's not, not ambient at all, probably. I don't know if you look to the classical definition of my friend Rudiger is doing ambient music, like this boneless um, 20 minutes pieces, really beautiful, but um, it's a different thing. And so it's hard to find the slot, especially when you look to professional PR agencies that are very slot oriented. I would say this is a critical thing. I, I imagine them uh, uh, asking you, so what genre do you play in? And you're yeah. like, ah, and that's it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I always describe my music since, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I describe it as cinematic since I found out that cinematic is a genre and it's something different probably than mine because it's about these epic orchestral things which are not my, it's not my cup of tea so much and so it's really hard to 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 find a professional agent um uh, for guys like mine so i i decided to do it by myself and and i have to say after after testing out different ways it's i start to find out my patterns that somehow work out to create at least some of what i could say a small base audience that that attached to the tracks and and it's pretty interesting also to see for example at the moment Pandora Radio is my strongest um, uh, letter of outlet. So, um, so maybe it's also about finding the right target audience, the right service. Um, I think the guys on Pandora that listen to Pandora are a little bit more, yeah, audiophiles. There's a lot more audiophiles than probably on the average streaming of, of Spotify, for example. So it's interesting to find your ways to that jungle of possibilities and also I have my experiences with, with scam and things like that and tell you, well, that's really, really bad thing. So also there, there's a learning curve, uh, curve of course. So this curiosity in uh, learning about how things work is not only uh, Julian, the, the, the working guy, but also Julian, the musician, but uh, it has its ups and downs. So uh, it could also be to a dead end. Yeah. 
All right. So uh, the most important part you told me is there's there is something going to happen, and there will be more new tracks, and that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Would you? Would you? Last question of the night. Would you consider yourself a perfectionist, or do things come naturally and you just leave it them there once you once you found them interesting? Oh, well, uh, I would. Uh, early on, I would have described myself probably as someone who is not a perfectionist so being a bit spontaneous and also satisfied with a with a if, if a song is good but it doesn't have to match the the, the standards the, the platinum standards of, of production but seeing myself been working on the last tracks like for two or three months only for the for the mixing part and then also working together with the mastering engineers and seeing that my, my, my ambition is rising. <laughs> and, I, and I see that, especially when you have a track which is very important from, for yourself, like the previous two ones that I released are pretty, from, from, from the emotionally pretty important tracks. So I don't want to push them out in, in 90% mode, like, so they have to be 100%, at least for me. And so maybe I'm starting to get a bit more perfectionist. So I don't know. <laughs> that might be a curse down the road. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to be careful. So yeah. it's good to maybe some someday make a really rough uh, release someday and see what happens then. So yeah, uh, yeah like a, like a friend of mine, a mixer, always told me you can spend days and nights mixing one single track, and no one will yeah. ever know because you are the only one hearing the nuances of the, the single uh, layers of it. So he just he yeah, can, and sometimes he, it's. Yeah, yeah, you can do a mix in, in five minutes and it sounds as good as he'd spend three hours on it. So, yeah, and then you take what the artist offers you, and if you like it, it's not about the quality, the perfection of the mix. Some of the most beloved tracks are, be are loved because of their mistakes, somehow, sometimes the, the raw and edgy feel and the honest feel connected to it. So. Yeah. All right, Julian, thank you very much for meeting me tonight. Yeah. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you very much, Florian. Guys, if you want to know more about Julian Petrin and his work, please make sure to check out the links in the description of the video. That's it for now. All I have to say is be safe. Until next time. Bye.